Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, cubes and clouds. What is this going to be today? Um, yesterday, we've learned an exciting way of how to organize people in circles in an Estonian dance that we did together. So that was a really interesting, exciting, and I think it was a traditional way of uh, doing things. So today we are going to take a different approach and we're not organizing people in circles. Now today we're going to organize spatial data in cubes and we're going to learn the new approaches that are available. So we're trying to leave the old approaches and yeah, do a step in the new direction. And this talk is going to be about cubes and clouds. So it's an online course to educate the next generation of Earth observation researchers or generally um, geospatial researchers um, in data cubes. So that is a big topic that we've heard about in this conference. Um, cloud platforms, cloud technologies, that's also a very big topic these days. And also in open science. So not only how do we operate, but also how do we work together. And below you see um, this is a joint effort, effort of a huge team and I'm here to talk in their name today. So, um, what is our aim with this uh, online course? Maybe I should say a MOOC is a massive open online course. It's freely available and open to everybody um, who is interested in learning new things about the topics we just talked about and why do we need um, this kind of course. So, just the last talk already said, um, making tutorials and this stuff is still underappreciated in the um, scientific community and also the newer um, technologies are the less chances you have to find a curated course on the topics especially since we're talking about um, how to organize spatial data how to operate spatial data in clouds and how to share it is three different topics that you actually need to conduct um, research um, in the nowadays in the modern ways and to collaborate so having these three things tied together um, is an effort that we did and I think there is no other resources currently available that are doing this. So this is a good starting point for everybody who wants to dive into these topics. And so as said, we are trying to make the transition from the traditional ways of working with in Earth observation or in geospatial um, easier. So I guess everybody knows you've been working on laptops probably and you are well aware of how to do this, but it's good that somebody helps you to go in the direction of how to use a cloud for some, or if you've never heard the term cloud before, it can be a little bit intimidating. What's happening in the cloud? What are the concepts behind this? And why do I have to leave my old structure behind? What do I do this for? So I think this little barrier to jump over, we're trying to get people into um, jumping this first hurdle, and then I think they're free again to work in whichever way they want to. So that's um, our idea and the target group is that our young researchers or researchers that um, want to advance their knowledge in cloud technologies. So how do we do this? Um, how do we convey the message? There, we're using um, three pillars. On the one hand side, we're starting to teach the concepts. And this is, yeah, you, for, before you start, you really have to learn um, what the concepts um, behind data cubes and cloud computing actually are and also behind open science. So this is a theoretical approach that we speak the same language, that we speak um, the same definitions, which is already difficult when you think about cloud platforms and what is a service provider, um, what is a data provider, these things, what is a server, what is a client. So this can be a little bit intimidating, so we're just trying to get everybody on the same page there. The same is true for data cubes and why do we need this, why can't I just work with files? Um, what is a virtual data cube, what is the dimension of a data cube, what are labels, and so on. And then the same is true for open science. Um, why is this important? How can I actually do open science? What are the paths that I can take to make my data open? So what are DOIs? How do I create them? And so on. So this is the first step. Once we speak um, the same language or all on the same page, we're going to the um, second chapter, that is discovery. And there we're starting to understand and interact um, with the technologies that we have talked about. So we're going to discover um, these clouds and the cubes that are saved in clouds via various data catalogs. So where can I actually find all this data that everybody's talking about in big data? But you need an access point where to find it and you also know, need to know how to use um, these tools to find the data. 
So that's one part. Then also we're going to search data properties because when you're talking about big data, you don't directly want to download the data first. Maybe you need to know how can I actually filter data? What are um, properties that I can use for that? What are um, file formats that are suitable for working in the cloud and for sharing data? And what are the processes that are actually available um, on a cloud format? So somehow you need to know how you can actually interact with the cloud and which kind of analysis you can do there. Um, once we're done with this, we're actually going to apply everything we learned in a real world um, scenario. So you're going to start processing a whole workflow from end to end um, in the cloud. You're going to validate these results. And in the end, you're also going to share um, the map that you have created in an open community project. So in this case, um, here you're going to make a snow map. You're going to select um, a small area of the Alps that hasn't been mapped before apply a process by loading the data, um, subsetting the data to the area that is relevant for you, um, aggregating the data, doing some cloud masking, doing some thresholding, and in the end you will arrive at a binary snow classification. But that's not done, then we're showing how you can validate um, this snow map. And once you've validated it, we're also going to upload it um, onto a public available um, stack browser. And the participants are learning how do I fill stack fields and how do I publish my data. And in the end, this data is um, constantly available on a stack browser. So when you're done, you can go to your employer maybe and show them, look, this is a um, piece of a map that I've created on this cloud that I've been using. And you can see that I can actually adhere to all of the things that I told you that I'm able to do. And how do we convey all of these messages? So that was a very, let's say, theoretical concept that we talked about so far, but how does this um, manifest itself? Um, on the one hand side, we're using lectures, of course. They are on the um, e-learning platform EO College. So we have text forms. We have the three chapters that we have already talked about. And every chapter has sub-chapters and a quiz at the end. Um, but that's not everything, so reading um, tires is tiring, I guess, after a while. So we've also added um, a series of videos. I think we have like 16 or 20 videos in this whole course that are picking out, let's say they're shining a light on a very special part of um, the lecture that we have been talking about. For example, the one we see here. Um, this is the chapter about open source software, and here we are highlighting um, the role of GDAL in the open source bio geospatial world. So why is GDAL important? What, why is open source software important? And what is GDAL's role in cloud computing? And we've created these videos um, with experts in the field, and this one was the main developer was helping us to create the video. So they're very short, but they're very precise on one point and just show you the application of um, what you're learning in the real world. Um, besides the videos, we also have a lot of animated content, so little games that you can play here, for example. This is um, what does FAIR stand for, and we have a couple of keywords that you can drag onto the different letters, and you will get a little score in the end. So there are a lot of these. And that's not all, so, so far we are learning, but then the hands-on experience is very important as well. So you're also learning to code in this course. Um, there are predefined Jupyter notebooks that you can execute and yeah, that guide you through different steps of programming and you have different questions after, these, after you've completed these um, notebooks. Um, if you have got the, the right answers, for example, how many pixels are in this data cube in the end of the exercise. So how does this um, actually look like? because there's quite a complex infrastructure behind that. I'm trying to go quick through that. That's quite a technical slide, but I think it's still important to understand um, the effort that is behind um, making such a course. Also, trying to make it a one-stop shop that you start at EO College and you don't have to worry about registering um, to a Jupyter Notebook, registering to a cloud. So this is all explained and you go through it um, in one step. And of course, you have to make choices at a certain point, which technologies are you going to use? You cannot um, depict all different um, ways of programming. For example, we're using Python now. Would be nice to also use R, but we had just to make some choices to stay within the budget. 
but the course is open, everything's available on GitHub, and we're really happy if somebody wants to contribute, and we're already starting now with an add-on project to also incorporate other programming languages. So, but how does it work? As said, um, there is an e-learning platform, which is the central access point, that is EO College. Um, once you register there, you also um, register directly at uh, Jupyter Hub. So that is um, where the UX Jupyter Hub, that is where the notebooks are hosted and where you have your environment, your programming environment. The notebooks that are hosted on Jupyter Hub come from GitHub, so you can also access everything that is available in this course on GitHub. The whole course is on GitHub. It's also on Zenodo, so you can download versioned, um, ed versioned um, editions of the whole course and you can also reuse it. You don't have to use it in EO College. You can just take the markdown files, render them wherever you want. You can pick whatever you want, you can open issues. If something is not working or you have ideas to collaborate. And yeah, it's, we also did it to show that working openly is not just taught in the course, but it's also a real practice. Um, then the animated content we've created on the Creation Hub using H5P widgets. The videos are hosted um, on YouTube. And the results that you generate um, on the cloud, so we choose um, this time the Copernicus data space ecosystem is the cloud that you're going to log into and you're doing it with the programming language OpenEO or with the cloud communication language OpenEO with this API. And as said, we're also working on integrating um, the Pangeo community that you have different ways of doing things. Um, the results you create are uploaded from Jupyter Hub to a public stack catalog and are made available, disseminated via stack browser. So that's the, the background architecture that is completely open and can be reused also for other courses if you want to continue in this direction. So um, I think it's time to go on a user journey. So now we've talked about this course a lot, but now let's look together how it actually looks and feels. And I hope that this is going to motivate some of you to maybe subscribe to the course or in case you're university teachers or whatever, um, maybe have some students take the course. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to EO College and searching the course cubes and clouds. And you're arriving on the landing page with all the information. So you have all the links here to the GitHub community, to the Zenodo community, to the Stack Browser, and so on. You have the description of the course, and you see how far you are in the course and how many lessons are there, how many topics, how many quizzes, and so on. So this is the main entry point. Um, then once you start, you click on a lesson and you're going to start the course. This is how the look and feel of the um, e-learning platform is. So you have um, your navigation, bar on the side. Now this is, yeah, I've done the course, so the screenshot indicates that I'm already done with everything, but actually you're unlocking every step um, by completing the last one. And you also see how, does, um, how do these interactive um, animations work. So this is where you will be learning most of the time. Um, this is how you go to the hands-on exercises so you can stay within Jupiter, uh, within uh, EO College and you just click on the exercise button and it directly forwards you to your um, personal Jupiter Hub environment where you find um, the different exercises. There's also a catalog that you see up here that shows all the different exercises. You just click on execute and you can start programming. And here you see this is the result of the um, of the final exercise or of the validation exercise. So here you see um, the snow-covered area that is a binary pixel map that you have created, aggregated for um, the catchment. You see you have a high volume of snow cover in the high winter time, then it's decreasing and you have low snow cover in July. And at the same time as a validation or a plausibility analysis, um, you can look at a um, discharge that is, of course, growing in the river once the snow is melting. Then these are the quizzes, how they look like. So um, once you finish the quizzes and you finished um, the exercises, this is your last um, exercise, let's say. This is a snow, this is an example from the Stack Browser that is online. So here's the 
the participant Caroline Göhner. And you see she's calculated um, a snow map here. It's available um, on the Cubes and Clouds um, stack browser and it's publicly available. And there's also, this is not a, the stack item, but there's also the catalog above this. So there's slowly every participant that is doing the course, the next person can maybe pick the next patch here and start um, classifying the snow cover in a different region. And once enough people have classified the snow cover, we will at some day have a full snow cover map of the Alps or of the world. So that's the idea behind um, showing what a community actually, what community is and how you can share your data. Once you're done with this, there's a certificate that you can also put on LinkedIn. And as I said, you have um, the proof that you've done the work on the publicly available stack browser. Here's some user numbers. Um, yeah, we have so far, we have 300 users at the moment, or 400 around. Um, what we have seen so far, a lot of people have subscribed and stopped at lesson one. So not so many people, there are a lot of people still in, in progress at the moment and 50 have completed the course so far. I think that's normal at the beginning, a lot of people just want to look, um, does this actually work, what is it? But we hope that the number of people that complete the course is going to um, increase in future. Um, as a, yeah, I said, as this is a community um, project. We're also happy to see that we have participants from all continents, um, mostly from Europe so far. That's, I think, logically since it's an ESA-funded project, but it's also great to see that we have from um, participants from other continents. And talking about the target group that we've identified before, so young researchers in the field of um, EO or geospatial, I think that is, we hit it quite well there. We see that most of the people are juniors, um, PhD candidates or students with around a little bit less than five years experience. So that's actually the ideal target group. Um, then we also wanted to evaluate, um, does this course actually help or do people feel that they have a feeling of confidence after they finish the course? So here we had um, some questions that we asked before the course and some after. We don't have so many people that answer the questions after the course so far because it's, uh, it's not mandatory. But you see we have a rating from one to five. Um, how confident am I using EO platforms? Um, how independent am I using EO platforms? And how well can I adhere to open science? Yet, as I said, numbers are not really matching, so uh, a statistical analysis would be said too much, but at least I think you can see a tendency that after the course there is no participant who is completely afraid of um, using cloud platforms, especially not doing open science, so we see people can ad adhere to open science afterwards. Um, they feel independent on cloud platforms, and they, they want to use cloud platforms in the future. So I think that is a good sign in the right direction. We're looking forward um, to having more participants, maybe some of you. And if you're not participating, there are also um, other ways to engage in the course on your college, on GitHub, on Zenodo, and via the Stack browser. Are there questions from the audience? Hi, uh, Hi. I'm Henrik Denkone from Aalto University of Finland. Uh, first of all, brilliant work. Uh, I, I really like what you have, you have been doing. And actually, we have been doing something similar in, in Finland for uh, vector data processing uh, related things. So I have a couple of questions uh, that relate to our experiences with this, so first thing is that, do you provide some kind of support for the students when they are doing, for example, the exercises? Uh, and the other thing is the, the certificate. So would that certificate be also applicable so that actually the students taking the course would be able to use, like get credits for the university? Kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, thanks for the questions and uh, great to hear that there's a similar movement also for vector processing. Maybe we can combine them or at least make them available somewhere in the same region that people can yeah, work together and somehow get their learning path um, through modern GIST technologies. And the first question was, do we support um, students um, with the exercises? That's a good question, especially in the, let's say in this environment, cloud technologies are changing so rapidly that it's a, yeah, almost a miracle that 
the notebooks will work for a year without maintenance. So I said we use the, the GitHub um, community there, our GitHub repository for that. We encourage also on the landing page, we encourage the students to raise the issues themselves as they find them. And, and then, of course, we, we, once we get an issue log, we, we discuss it with the, the students there. So that's the kind of support that we give at the moment, and I think that's also a good idea to kind of push or the people in the direction of using GitHub if they're not already um, used to it. And the second question was about the certificates. Um, so we have um, calculated the hours that you usually need for the course, and we have translated this into ECTS points. But it, there's no official university, I think, that will that have has accepted this course yet. It, universities are open to do so, but I think you can you can take the course, you can um, show the certificate to your supervisor or to whoever, and if the university says, okay, I want to accept this course, they can. So we have let's say we've laid it out as far as we can. Is the, is the number of ECTS uh, on that certificate? Um, or is it that the, that the universities can actually directly see? Because with uh, you know, ESRI courses, they actually write also how many ECTS you could get. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, we, I, have, I have to check. I think it's around two ECTS. And I'm not 100% sure where this is written out. I think I'd have to look to the certificate to figure it out. But yeah, I think there is a, ah, yeah, there's a diploma supplement, that's the name. The diploma supplement we give in addition to the certificate that shows um, what have you learned and how many hours have you spent on different things and what does that translate to in ECTS. So this is something you can give to your university to, that makes it maybe a little bit easier to get the credits for it. I have a question. Um, Hans van der Kost, IHC Delft Institute for Water Education. Um, about the LMS that you're using, is that custom made or is it also uh, an existing uh, LMS like Moodle, your, your EO platform? That is the e-learning platform, right? Yeah. Yeah. EO College, um, that is a spin-off from the University of Jena um, and they're specializing in spatial um, Yes, it's a spatial e-learning platform, so they have different topics, especially on Earth observation so far. A lot of courses that have been funded by ESA end up there, so it's already a big pool. Um, how to learn Earth observation from very basic things to hyperspectral Earth observation to SAR stuff to how these translate into SDGs. So there's really already a wealth on EO College, so once you go there and click through it, you will see that there's really a whole lot of um, courses already available. Great, and then can I ask a second question? Um, the hosting of the Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you use the EOX uh, services, so is that expensive? So if I would like to host things there? Um, EOX was a partner in the project. We also have, we had Tina here at least, who is a part of the company. They also have their booth um, over in the um, exhibition area. And in this course, I think they're currently still doing it in kind, so that is great for this course, but for the pricing generally, um, I don't know their, their pricing scheme. So far they're doing it in kind for education, so that's great, and we're happy that they're on the team.